All right, everybody, welcome back. This is a really interesting webinar we have today for folks coming in from uh, Elemental Ecosystems. Welcome, folks coming in from Sustainable Design Class, Sustainable Design Masterclass. Welcome, great to have you back on. Folks are coming in from Water Stories or Regen Canada or Permies or the Soil Regen Summit. We really appreciate everyone who's coming in to give us your time to learn about water restoration. So my name is Raleigh Latham and I have the great pleasure of working with uh, Zach Weiss and Cassie Langstrad on a project called Water Stories, which we're going to give everybody the opportunity to learn about water restoration training, science, theory, practical DIY, and inspiring stories about people who are water restoration pioneers. And so I'm excited today to introduce you all to Zach Weiss. I've had the pleasure of working with Zach the last five or six years. I met him at a Sepp Holzer workshop and saw his, his tenacity, his ruthless, what do you call it, this ruthless tenacity for water restoration and see him just jumping from building natural swimming pools to ponds, to crater gardens, to hugel beds that extend for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meters. It, it never ends. Zach is what he's done. It just scaled out so far and it's really inspiring at a practical level to see these, these pond projects just sweeping across country to country. And so Zach is a protege of, of this famous mountain farmer, Sepp Holzer, which many of you know, but he's taken Sepp's work and, and putting it in the context of, of a global context and showing people how to restore water, how to restore water on their landscapes wherever they are. And so Zach has been leading these practical water restoration projects over the last, what, almost seven to 10 years. And he, he has tremendous insights from doing these, from leading these crews. So I'm really excited to share these insights, share these case studies of water restoration in action. And before we get started, I'm gonna share a little bit about the structure of what we're doing. Now, normally we let a Q&A at the end, but what we're gonna do here is introduce you to a platform that we can all sign up at the beginning so that we can get all our questions answered by Zach instead of doing that all on uh, the webinar. So I'm gonna share my screen here and introduce you, you guys to uh, the Water Stories platform. Give me one moment, I need to. Pull up Water Stories, okay, cool. So we have this platform, Water Stories, which is, you know, it's gonna be where we're gonna launch um, education, training, inspiration, everything that you need to know about practical water restoration training. But right now, the kind of the, the call to action of this whole thing is we would love you guys to join this community. And this is gonna be where to get, uh, to have questions answered, these are where questions are gonna live. So we'll, we'll post the link in the chat box. It's waterstories.circle. Dot so, uh, Cassie, if you could post that there, that'd be really useful. But it's really easy. You simply sign up here at that link, and then you'll be able to answer questions that Zach is going to be able to answer in this panel right here. And during this webinar, after the presentation, we're going to have a few live questions, kind of like call-in questions, maybe two or three, but the rest we're going to answer on, on this platform. So if you sign up, you'll get a sign-in link Again, it's Water Stories. You sign up, do I go into waterstories.app, you click on community, and then you'll be able to register um, for this platform. And then you'll go to Zach Weiss Q&A. And yeah, you'll be able to post your questions there and we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. So I hope, I hope that's clear for everybody. I'm really stoked to see how this plays out because this is, allows us to kind of have a permanent base of uh, water restoration community. All right. Thanks, Cassie. Oh, Cass, I'm gonna repost that to everybody because I think that was just posted to the panelists. So yeah, there's a link right here that folks can visit. It's waterstories.circle.so. Let me type the water, waterstories.app. That's the main URL where folks can visit to learn more about water stories. Now, without further ado, we're gonna turn this over to Zach and we're gonna learn all about 
restoring restoring community, healing community and ecosystems with water restoration. So take it away, Zach. Glad to have you on. Awesome. Thank you, Raleigh, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining here today. It's really awesome to see so many people joining from around the world, really interested in water. And so I want to share with you how we can really heal our communities and our ecosystems through water restoration. We have this situation in the world right now where our communities are in crisis all around the world. There's these so-called natural disasters, but really they're the result of our mismanagement. And no matter where you are in the world, you've started to experience some of these and there's only coming more coming if we don't change our reality. And so this all comes from the old water paradigm, this water paradigm that centered around draining water away. Now, when we were throwing our defecant in the streets and letting the rain carry it away, standing water was generally a bad thing. It was a vector for disease and issues like that. So we had to drain it away. Yet now we deal with this in a more sanitary way, but we still have the same paradigm around draining water. And so this is the LA River. This used to be an actual living river and it's been entirely concreted. And we're doing this around the world at a really alarming rate. And so what happens when you concrete those landscapes, naturally all that water that used to go into the ground runs downstream, causing flooding. And then because all that water drained away, you naturally have the next drought by design. And then in the worst landscapes, the drought becomes so severe that the fire actually takes over. And this is leading to huge issues of human quality of life, starvation crises, food shortages, water shortages, refugee crises, war, and it's really leading to this situation that's catastrophic. You can look at some of these examples like Australia. Being in Australia for those massive fires, it was just insane how, how degraded and how damaged the landscape is. You had these fires burning all over the country. You had people going to the ocean for safety because it was the only safe space. And yet one of the few trees that's really trying to repair that scenario, the willow that retards the fire, that holds the erosion, there's an active campaign to poison and kill as an invasive species. And so we're so disconnected from our environment that we're not able to make good management solutions. You know, we wonder why when we make these concrete metropolises, there's all of a sudden a lot of flooding downstream, when in reality that makes total sense and it's causing enormous stress for our ecosystems. But you have that stress of the flooding times, and then you have these areas that are just burning and desertifying, and it's this stress of extremities. Plants and ecological systems, they base around a dynamic equilibrium and a balance of different effects, a balance of temperatures, a balance of humidities. These extremes are really putting our ecosystems under tremendous stress. But this isn't a talk about that. This is a talk about returning water to the landscape and how this can correct all of those previous misdeeds. So this is a project in Portugal. This is a community that didn't have enough water. They barely had enough water for drinking for their community and no water for gardens. Yet in that same area, this is now what exists. This is the Tamara Peace Research Center. And so they came to Sepp Holzer and said, how do we survive here? He looked at the landscape, he looked at what they had, and he figured out the way to use the natural elements to heal the land. So this is filled only with rain from the sky. This isn't using aquifer water. This is only returning water from the sky to the earth. And so what they did in an area that was a road that was draining this watershed, they built a dam to help hold that water and infiltrate it. Now, really interesting, when they were doing this, the neighbors were all up in arms. They said, you're stealing our water, but now they love it because instead of one month of flooding and 11 months of drought, they have consistent, steady year round water fed by this water retention landscape. And so now this community is on their own springs and charged by their retention landscape. And they've actually become not only water self-sufficient, but water regenerative, where they're infiltrating more water into the ground than they're using each year. We can really look at our water bank within the ground as a bank account. We all know what happens if we extract more than we put in. And the longer that goes on, the harder it is to correct. Once you accumulate a tremendous debt, it's really hard to get out of that. And the same thing is true with water. 
So what we need to be doing is a little bit all the time putting extra water into the earth for future times. Because water really is the blood of the earth. When you think about the cycle of sweet water, of fresh water through the planet, that exactly mirrors the cycle of blood through our own body. And all of these more elaborate concepts, you can really bring back to just that key scenario. And when we start to understand this, it becomes really clear why fertilizers are a really bad idea. You wouldn't do that to your skin. It becomes really clear why pulling out water from the body and spraying it on the surface also isn't a great idea. If we were to do that to our blood to hydrate our skin, that's gonna go pretty bad pretty quickly. Um, and you can really see this, you know, in the streams and the creeks and the rivers and the different water bodies, you can see how the flow of water through the earth really mirrors our own architecture within our bodies. And similarly, when you have these giant dams and reservoirs, it's stopping flow through the system. And so it's about this decentralized management within the landscape. And it's not just the waterways that are part of these organs, but it's actually the forests that are a really essential part. Not only are they transpiring water, they're feeding water into the small water cycle. That's 50% of our precipitation. They're creating those humidity effects and those water vapor currents, those rivers in the sky. And they're actually also seeding rainfall. So this is the natural water cycle. You have the sun evaporating water off the ocean, that humidity coming inland. But in order to become clouds and then rain, it needs a nuclei around. One of the main nuclei are, are hygroscopic microorganisms. And so these organisms attract water around these microorganisms. The water coalesces into water droplets, forming clouds and then rain. Then that phase change from really big to quite small creates an additional vortex drawing in additional moisture from the coast. Trees are transpiring humidity, cooling the atmosphere and creating more low pressure, which again triggers that low pressure pump to bring in humidity from the coast. And so you have this conveyor belt called the biotic pump on the cool shaded soil. That water is infiltrating and going deep into the earth, charging springs and reservoirs and coming as clear, cool water. And so when we have this water infiltrated into the earth, we have an abundance of fish. We have an abundance of life because the system is healthy and charged with vitality. So this is a system called the biotic pump and it's moving water from the ocean through the continents and back again. Then there's also the small water cycle, water that's staying within location and that's half of our precipitation as well. So it's this mix of the big water cycle from the oceans into the continents and then the small water cycle, what's evaporated and condensed right in situation. So this is, that's the natural state of the planet. It's one of health and balance. It's one where there's a really stable climate. There's a really stable amount of water in the soil. There's a really stable amount of water in the atmosphere and there's a stable temperature throughout. And this is really, the climate of life, the climate of abundance. And this is nothing new. You know, this goes back to Victor Schauberger a long time ago. He was speaking then about the full water cycle and the half water cycle, about how when that soil is shaded, it's able to really absorb the water and feed into the ground. And this makes a steady flow through the system. When that system is disturbed, when the ground is made hot and dry, all of that water runs off leading to flooding, but then also leading to drought and a systematic desertification of the landscape. Where did this start? In my mind, this really started when humans came up with the delusion of humans as commander in chief. When we went from this role of part of the web of life to thinking that we're the commanders of the web in life which is certainly not the case. I mean, you don't have to look far for the examples to understand that. But what happened when we did that is we started to just look at all these things in the sky and on the ground and in the water, not as beings with sacred energy and with a role to play within the environment, but as energy to be exploited, as a resource to be exploited. And this really came with colonization. When we really started somehow convincing the masses 
to extract all of the wealth from landscapes to ship it away to accumulate it to a few small people. And so you can see this is New York City under indigenous stewardship and under colonial stewardship. In one of these, there's a worldview that everything is alive and sacred and has a role. In the other, it's everything with energy to exploit. And so this is causing a catastrophe around the world. This is a hydrograph. This is the water flow through the system over time in two different scenarios, those two different ones. So in one scenario, we have a rich vegetated landscape. We have trees that with every calorie of water, they're transpiring, they're cooling the air 590 calories. We have a soil temperature that's cool and that's loose. It's able to absorb that water. And in the other scenario, we have concrete. We have a hard, dense landscape. Doesn't allow water to infiltrate. It doesn't cool anything and it actually holds the heat and re-radiates it. And so in the one scenario, when the water comes, it's almost all runoff and nothing really infiltrates into the system. So you have this huge pulse of water, but you also have a really narrow window of photosynthetic growth. You have a very narrow growing season because all that water pulses through the system. What happens when it pulses? Well, there's a lot of erosion. There's the risk of flooding. There's the cost of those repairs. There's the insurance. Then there's the finance cost because you can't afford any of that. But then by nature, you're designing in the next drought and the next fire, which comes with its own erosion, risk, cost, insurance, and finance. And it's really creating a situation that's just not viable for land stewards and farmers alike. The alternative is this rich living vegetated landscape that allows, there's still some runoff, but much less because that water is able to infiltrate into that cool, loose ground. And what happens is then it goes through the system slowly through the percolation in the soil. And then you really have this long photosynthetic growing period, which then you have this area that's actually constantly cooling as those plants are transpiring, which is making lower, more low pressure to draw in more humidity. And so these are really positive feedback loops in both directions. Now, when we look at what's happened around the world, you know, this is the Levant. This at one point was one of the most fertile places in the world. It was the birthplace of agriculture, but with the plow, with the destruction of the vegetation and with the domestic animal and the continued abuse of that vegetation, the continued reduction of complexity within the landscape that actually created this desert. And the same things happened around the world in Africa, in the Tibetan Plateau. You can see so much of the world has been colonized. And in that colonization, there was an also an embedding of a thought process within the people to extract the resources from the landscape, to not be part of the landscape and stewards within it, but extract the resources so that they can go elsewhere. And it's really a shame because that doesn't serve the people on those landscapes it only serves the greed of a handful of people. And so through colonization over 10,000 years, we have desertified one third of the entire earth. That's really a shocking figure. And it really scares me. In a place like Australia, colonization was its own geological event. When they colonized, they abused the landscape so hard and it's such an old landscape. They put so many animals on it and destroyed the vegetation that when the big rains came, it actually caused a big erosion event. So all of the bad soils up in the highlands washed down and covered all of the rich floodplain soils that had been there previously. And so you see here that natural floodplain soil that's really beautiful and black buried under, you know, 20 centimeters of basically gravel because of this landscape abuse. And now we're getting even better at it. We're making these concrete metropolises. We're draining the water faster and better than ever before. And that's what really scares me about all of this. You know, this is a tree that I visited that was on the continent before Columbus arrived. When this tree was young, you could drink from any body of water in the Americas. Now in Minnesota, there's not even a single lake that meets the quality standards for fishable or swimmable. So in just a short period of time, we've gone from pure, clean, healthy water everywhere to entire watersheds really in stress and in poor condition. 
And so how do we do that? Well, we took this landscape and first we cleared the land to harvest the timber value. We drained the wetlands to get the arable soils. And then we really established the dry open lands. We built cities, we built drainage systems and we systematically desertified the landscape. On those hot dry areas, it's like a hot dry sponge or like a baked clay pot. The water just runs right off. None of it can actually infiltrate in. And so what happens, the rivers are full of too much material because all of that erosion is leading downstream. So we dredge the rivers, just deepening the gouges in those veins. And all the while the water table is sinking and the water quality is declining. Now on all those hot open areas, heat masses began to rise and form columns and high pressure systems that push against that humidity trying to enter from the coast. Eventually the pressure becomes so much that it overwhelms and you get these huge cloudburst events with long periods of drought in between. And so when, when that pressure finally overwhelms, the storms are so powerful that they're destructive and they lead to all this erosion and flooding. But because that water doesn't sink into the landscape, we have flooding, yet we have the water table also sinking because it's all running away. Springs start drying up, creeks run low and heat up, the rivers run dry, less fish, less life, and the ecosystems really begin to collapse. And so humans in our infinite wisdom, we drill deeper into the ground, depleting the fossilized water in the aquifers. Eventually that water runs out, the crops fail, and eventually the fires come and the whole landscape burns. And we've really created these dry, desertified landscapes and desert where it once was rich land. And so this is a cycle of extremes, extreme flooding followed by extreme drought, followed by extreme fire. And hopefully this is starting to sound familiar because this is what we're experiencing. You know, over the last decade and over the coming decades, more and more until we start changing this feedback loop, our extremes are just gonna become greater and greater and more and more catastrophic. And it's really a shame because there's so much potential. There's so much potential in the natural landscape. And so this is what I call the watershed death spiral. This is this positive feedback loop that the drier we get, the drier we get, the less water goes into the ground, the drier we get, the less precipitation we have in the small water cycle, the drier we get. And it's this positive feedback loop leading us to a really bad spot. If you wanna get an idea of what that looks like, go to Australia during fire season, go to some of these places during the flooding season, it really looks bad. It looks like world wars being fought over water and that's not a future I wanna entertain. So this is a feedback loop. It's a feedback loop that we can reverse. It's something that we can change. And when we do, we have all the forces of nature working with us. We start to re-trigger the biotic pump. The more water we put into the ground, the more vegetation that naturally comes. The more vegetation that naturally comes, the more humidity in the air and the more nucleates in the atmosphere, creating more rain, which feeds more vegetation, which feeds more rain. And so life begets life. And once we start repriming this biotic pump, it starts working with us to greater and greater effect. So I really owe so much to this man, Sepp Holzer, the rebel farmer, who really taught me so much about how to manage water, how to work with nature. And he created this beautiful place up in the mountains of Austria land that was supposed to be unusable, yet he created a Garden of Eden. And he taught me first and foremost to always learn from the book of nature, that nature has for all the questions an answer. And we have to look to communicate with nature, to learn from nature, and that beautiful 3.5 billion years of evolution that we have in an example. And so on their farm, they're really working with nature in a dynamic sense. Here's an area where they have cherry trees and they have mushroom logs growing in the same area. So in a really wet year, the cherries are splitting and molding and they don't even worry about harvesting them because the mushrooms are having a bumper crop. In a really dry year, the mushrooms aren't producing so well, but the cherries are an exceptional quality for schnapps. And so with this kind of strategy, no matter what happens in any given year, the farmer can really appreciate and acknowledge the weather. It no longer is too hot or too dry or too wet or too cold. 
now every year, despite what happened, something had a bumper crop because in these natural interconnected ecosystems, that's how it works naturally. So this is the project we started with. This was a degraded wetland that someone had built an airstrip through. And in 11 days, we transformed it into this ecological oasis where you can now see tracks of any type of wildlife in Montana. There's turtles breeding, waterfowl, and it's really an incredible transformation for an area that used to be an airstrip. And that's far from the most impressive project he's done. This is one in the Extremadura in Spain, a spot where it's 45 degrees and hot blowing winds that's Celsius throughout the summer for three months. Yet he created this interconnected system of water bodies that helps hydrate the land. And so what's really important here is it's using earthen resources and structuring those in a way not to hold the water separate from the land, but to return the water to the land. And it's really finding those essential points, those acupuncture points within the earth where we can do a little bit of work to have a really big impact. And so what this looks like is it's finding the areas where water is naturally collecting and where water can be stored and working with the clay layers. Now we're usually looking for a clay layer within the ground that we can tie a keyway dam into. And so we're only creating a watertight layer on the downhill side that ties into the natural clay layer. Now what this does that's really important is it doesn't just hold the water in the water body, it actually holds the water in the landscape as well. So here you see this water body, but you see this whole area upstream, uphill, that's also green and hydrated. And so these water bodies are actually holding much more water in the earth than just what's in the water body itself. And so now this is a really beautiful landscape the largest ecological point of interest in Europe. And here's an area where storks and swallows are living in the same tree, like a kind of hotel. And you go through here and you're driving through the desert, just this harsh, unimaginable landscape. And you get to this oasis that's really amazing to experience. Now, really important is it's not just creating the water bodies. It's really easy to focus on the water bodies, but this is a connected system. And you have to really do the treatment of the catchment area in conjunction with the water body. And those two make this system work really well together. So here's a different project. And in this project, the uphill areas were terraced and forested. And then in these lower areas, some retention bodies were made. Now, really important is in this climate, if it was just the retention bodies, they would never hold water. It gets too hot and too dry for too long, and there's not enough water to get through the long dry season. But because of those terraces and that vegetation, when the rain does happen, it's infiltrating that into the ground. And then two, three months after the last rain, water is still moving through the earth into these water bodies. And so without that terracing and those tree systems, these water bodies wouldn't work. But as part of a connected system, they really have an amazing impact. And so we're really looking at how water is moving through the earth, what the geological layers are, where there are layers that are permeable, layers of geology that water flows through, and where there are layers that are impermeable, layers that water can't move through. So we're always starting with test slices, where we're starting to build in our heads a geological profile of the landscape to understand at what layers we encounter and what depths we encounter different layers and how water is moving through that landscape. Is all the water moving off of the surface? Is it moving through a subsurface layer? Is it just infiltrating down to bedrock? These are all different scenarios that we've encountered and worked with. So there's three really important pieces to building a water body. One that I just mentioned is the geology. What is the structure of sand, silt, and clay? Clay is really the thing that holds the water. And do you have enough of a clay layer or enough clay to make that barrier layer within the dam to hold your water back? Second thing is ge geography, the catchment area and how much water is actually moving through that. So here you see a topographic map. So it's important to understand what percentage runoff does your landscape experience? Is all of the rain running off? Is none of the rain running off? And then what kind of an area is feeding to those different points within the landscape? And then where are the constriction points? 
where are the areas that you can make the smallest earthwork for the largest amount of water? And those are the areas that you wanna work with. Now, the third factor that I think is the most important is tying into the veins of the earth. Where is their flow? Where are their springs? Where is their subsurface flow? These are the elements that really start to yield big results. And you'll see this even more with these projects in India. I'll show you later on in the presentation. So this gives you an idea of some of those points within that landscape where for a very small earthen feature, you can hold back a large amount of water so that our impact in this landscape can really be maximized. And so we're making that key way down, we're making that slice all the way down to the natural clay layer that we're tying into. And then we're filling just a little bit at a time and compacting it at the right moisture. If it's too dry, it doesn't work. If it's too wet, it doesn't work. But at just the right moisture, we can get a good compaction on that clay rich material to make our barrier layer. So this is what that looks like on another project. You can see the nice blue clay here. And so we're actually making a slice. Here, the situation is that there's a permeable layer and then an impermeable clay layer. So we're making a slice through that permeable layer down to the impermeable one and then filling that and packing it with this blue clay as we go up to make sure we have a good connection there. And so this is what that same project looks like later on, uh, the first picture I showed. Once it fills and you can see again, it's a mixture of terraces with tree systems that are really helping that water go into the ground and then water bodies that help hold that water for longer in the system. So this is another example. This is one of my favorite things to do, to find an area where it's a spring that previously someone drained, as is the case here, and then you're able to make a water body out of that. So that spring is just upstream of this area. You can see here we've cored out down to that darker clay layer, and you can see with equipment, we're layering that clay layer a bit at a time through the key all the way up to where our water level is. So here's further on with that same project. Now we've brought the clay up all the way to water level. And then at the end, you can see what it looks like finished. Um, now, really important is to factor in how water is entering and exiting the system. Water, it can have tremendous energy and it can be so soft and gentle, but it can flow and crash and really destroy stuff if you don't do it right. So it's really important to make these rock armored spillways so that where water moves, it's losing its force through those rocks and those rocks help prevent the erosion and it forms a natural creek bed uh, that enables our water to safely enter and exit the water bodies. Now it's really important decentralized. I can't emphasize that enough. People get really confused how I'll go on about how big dams are horrible, but then I'll go around creating little dams, but they have a very big impact, very different impact. When you create a bunch of little dams within the landscape, you're holding that water in the earth and returning it to the earth in a way that really recharges the watershed. When you're channelizing all of that water to certain areas and then holding that in big dams, it's great if you wanna make money off of the water, but it's not good for recharging the landscape with water. So you can look at these huge dams and they're just a catastrophic ecological crisis. There's no way for fish to move through this and they're draining so many different grounds to feed this reservoir and fill it with water. They're actually desertifying those parts of the landscape to then have this structure that's very engineered and not designed to give the water to the earth, but to hold the water as a giant earthen tank. And so I think it's pretty clear, hopefully for all of us, that if you need barbed wire and no trespassing signs, you're not treating water in a good way there. And we're really, you know, how is a fish supposed to move through this? How is the living systems within this water supposed to move through a spillway system like this? These are just engineering solutions to make money. They're not really about having a positive environmental impact. Now, here's another example. This is a reservoir in Spain. This was at the same visit as my trip to that Vivencia de Hisa, the project I showed earlier. This reservoir was 10 meters low. The towns were almost running out of water because again, they're draining all the water to certain places and using it like a tank. 
in this diverse landscape, Vivencia de Hisa, they have all these interconnected ponds and the water level was low, but it was one meter low, not 10, 12 meters low. And because there was so much water that had been charged into the landscape in the dry times, that water helped buffer the losses due to evaporation. So this leads me to another mentor, Rajendra Sin, the water man of India. And this is a really incredible story about what kind of impact decentralized water retention can have. So here he moved to this village. The people were struggling with the night blindness and an elder showed him, if you really wanna do something to help us, you have to do something for water because that's the root cause of these different issues we're facing. And so he took Rajendra down into different wells and he showed him the difference between horizontal fracturing in the geology and vertical fracturing in the geology. And so Rajendra started to learn about the watershed. Then he took him to this spot in the landscape and he said, you dig a Johad here. And so Rajendra started digging and as a doctor, he was made fun of for it. Doctors aren't supposed to get their hands in the earth, yet he persisted, he persevered. Eventually some people came and joined him. And what happened in the first rainy season, the Johad fills up, but more importantly, because of the vertical fracturing, that water went into landscape. And downstream, that well was recharged. And even in the dry season, it again was full of water. So all of a sudden, these people went from having no water to irrigate crops to having water to irrigate crops. And so they really started joining him. And this created a whole movement throughout India that's had incredible impacts over 35 years. So this is just one of the projects they've done. This is the before and this is the after. And you see the kind of change this creates in the landscape. This community. They were running out of water. They drilled 27 boreholes, all of which were dry. And then for the same cost, they built this one water body. They went from nine hectares of agriculture to over 650. They paid for the cost of the dam four times over in the first year in their increase in agricultural productivity. And this creates a huge ripple effect through the whole community. Not only that, this is something that if maintained, it will be in place for generations. So this one generation pays for it, but future generations for as long as this stays in place are gonna receive the benefit from it. And in India, this really makes a huge benefit for the women because if there's not enough water for the family, the women are the ones going to get it. And if that's not enough, it's the female children staying home, not going to school to help carry water for the family. And so in these communities where Rajendra is working, bringing water back to the community actually puts young women back in school. And so it starts to have this whole trophic cascade of impacts throughout the culture of the place. And it's really about understanding these areas where we can infiltrate water into the ground. So here he's showing me the vertical fracturing within the ground and how in this one area it changes from horizontal to vertical fracturing. And in that vertical fracturing, the water can enter into the ground. And so you see on the one side here, these are the same age trees, yet they look very different. They're very different in health and they're very different in size. The trees on the one side are tapped into that vertical fracturing. And so their roots are able to grow down and access the water. On this other side, there's the horizontal fracturing. And so the roots aren't able to work through that to access that water. So in this way, they actually use the trees as their guide to learn about the ecosystem, to understand where the best places for johads are. These are their ponds that they build, where the best places for recharge are, and where the best places for water storage are based on that horizontal or vertical fracturing within the ground. And so this is that first johad right here. And what happened is just downstream where these agriculture fields are, that's where the well is that was recharged. And so in these areas, they have such a long dry season, they actually want to put that water into the earth, get it away from the sun so that they can access it. So that if they even have a year where the monsoon doesn't come, they've put enough water in the ground to still survive and even thrive. And this starts with community organization. The really amazing thing about this is it's community driven, decentralized water management. And the government has tried to do the same projects, but had failures, even though they're using the same techniques, because getting that community buy-in is so key. 
So what they do is they go around to these villages and they get one member from each household into these water congresses, they call them. They discuss what the issues are in the community and how they might go about resolving these issues. Throughout the water congress, they can identify the different resources the community has, where they wanna do a project, and then as a community, they can act on that project. Now with that buy-in, the maintenance is already set up. There's a lot of buy-in from the people in the community. And so these projects are really a huge success because it's starting with the needs of the people in their place, their context, their understanding of their water needs and how to meet those. And so it's really important that this is not only decentralized in the landscape, but it's decentralized within the human social system as well. And this has had an incredible impact. Over their 35 years, they've restored seven rivers, seven rivers that in the past were perennial, then became seasonal, then became dry for long periods. Now they're flowing again year round. They've raised the water table more than five meters in some areas. They've recharged 250,000 wells. They've impacted a million people causing the reverse migration back to the agricultural lands because they have water again. And it all started with this one person recognizing there was an issue and they could do something about it. When people saw the results, people joined in and now it's become a whole movement in this part of Rajasthan. And this is just one example. There's tons of these. Willie Smith is a perfect example in Borneo where he started a project working with the locals to find good ways to steward the land and make conservation for orangutans. And in the process, they've measured a 25% increase in rainfall for themselves and downwind through their forestry practices. Another example is the lowest plateau in China. This was 2.27 million acres, one of the most ambitious projects, a whole desertified region that the government did this revival of. What were the results there? The ecosystem health was really revived. The food supplies were secured. They reduced their flood risk. They reduced their sedimentation in the waterways, but also incomes doubled and employment rates increased because water is really the capital of life. It's the capital that everything revolves around. And so when we do something for water, we do something for all life. And there are beautiful examples of communities organizing on the ground. This is in Raglan in New Zealand. At one point, this is one of the most productive bays. The Aboriginal people say, you used to be able to walk across the water on the backs of fish. At one point, this commercial fishery totally collapsed where there was no fishing at all anymore. And there just weren't fish in the bay. Now over 10 years, they've restored this to the point where there's again a viable commercial fishery. It's not what it was before, but it's greatly improved from what it was recently. And how did they do this? It was actually entirely done by fencing dairy cows out of the waterways, by allowing those waterways to revegetate and regenerate the health of this bay totally came back to life. Another story in Halcamoco, Mexico, this is one of my favorites. This is a community that really lives on the river. They were all fishermen and then now they're river guides and this is one of the best whitewater rafting places in the world. Now there's a government improved project to build a big hydropower dam on their section of the river that will effectively kill their section of the river, both in terms of fish and in terms of all of these activities that they do. Now for more than five years running, the people in this community have kept the government from building that dam. How do they do it? They actually have a citizen led volunteer initiative where they have 24 hour surveillance at the dam site. If any construction equipment shows up, they rally the troops and everyone in the town comes with their machetes and does not leave until the construction equipment leaves. And so for five years running now, these people on the land with a hard government to work with have actually come out on top just by rallying together and working together. And that's what we all really need to do for water. And so it really leaves me with thinking, what kind of footprint, what kind of impact are we making? Everyone talks about footprint in terms of having a less bad footprint. If we're only working in shades of bad footprint, we're never going to get to a positive place. I want to have the biggest environmental footprint possible because I know our footprint can be positive. And it's really up to us whether we wanna have that positive impact 
whether we want to use these found objects within the landscape, machines, technology. Humans have always worked with found objects within the landscape. And I think it's really our responsibility now to use some of these technological advances we have to undo some of the environmental degradation so that future generations really inherit a livable planet. And so I just, I feel this great honor and also a responsibility in having all of this time with SEP, learning from really this superhero in water restoration. And also my time with Rajendra, they've, they've shared with me so much knowledge and so much understanding about the landscape and their stories inspire so much. So this is really where the idea of water stories came from. How do we get all of these things that I've gained from these different heroes around the world into a platform where people can easily learn them and learn how to apply them on their own landscape. So that's really what we're aiming to build here. And if there's one thing these two men are both very passionate about, it's that water privatization is criminal. And I truly believe it should be prosecuted as such. And I would extend that to the whole natural capital movement. That scares the crap out of me because take water, for example, when water is managed for abundance, water doesn't have much value. If there's clean water everywhere, the price of water has to be cheap. If you want to make money off of water, you create scarcity. And increasing in scarcity, you can make great money off of water because everyone needs water. Everything needs water. And if we put these natural resources like water in the hands and control of bankers, they have no context of the landscape, they have no connection to the landscape and they have no caring for the landscape. And so they'll manage them to make the most money off of them, which means a scarce environment. And so really we need to come together to not let this happen. You can see in Australia, they've privatized their water supply. You have situations where the indigenous people haven't received water for years in their river, fish are, flopping around dying in the Murray Darling Basin because it's running out of water, yet you have farmers actually wasting water to artificially increase the price even more so that they can make even more money off of it. And this is really criminal and we need to come together as a human race and say, we're not gonna stand for this. We are gonna demand the communization of water. Water is a common good for humans, for earth and for all life on earth. And it's not just that, there's all these horrific examples of toxicity. And so I really applaud all the water protectors that are standing up to this. We need both. We need to start controlling the leaks, start controlling the catastrophes that are happening and also create the good things that we want. And we have to do the hand, the two hand in hand together to really get where we're trying to go. And so water is a common good and we really need to let people steward their water to steward their land water and the land go together hand in hand and people need the ability to wherever water is hitting the earth help hold it and infiltrate it into the earth we're all connected in this together you know impacts in the amazon create different hurricane impacts in different parts of the world we're all part of the web of life and we really can start working with it and we'll really achieve amazing things as soon as we do so i'm really worried that in the environmental movement we're hitching our cart to the wrong horse we're championing carbon which i really view as a symptom of the greater issue of the severe disturbance of the hydrological cycle of the planet of the heat dynamics on earth only around four to ten percent are regulated by carbon 70 to 95 percent are regulated by water and not just that if we're working in carbon we won't see the impacts of our work for 50 years. The buffering effects of the ocean are so huge. When we work in water, we see the impacts the first rainy season. The first time it rains, we see whether our work is working or not. And so it creates this feedback that people can really get behind. That's how this movement in India became such a tremendous thing. People saw the examples and they said, I'm doing that for myself. I'm doing that for my landscape. I'm doing that for my children. And so I really hope we can start to move the conversation away from this loaded topic that no one can agree on and move it to a place of shared values where everyone can agree. Do you drink water or not? 
Do you need water in your body or not? Do you want water for your children or not and for your landscape? And I think with these shared values, we can find common ground and then build a better future together. And it's really easy once we start working with the water, humans can be this catalyst for change. We can be the keystone species. When we start holding water within the landscape, when we start undoing some of these damages, you naturally get the return of the vegetation. And with the return of the vegetation, the return of the life, you get more water infiltrated into the ground. If we terrace and revegetate the hillsides, we'll start to really sink all of that water into the ground so that it can feed deeper into the watershed. We'll start to really create these dynamic interconnected ecosystems that help proliferate the complexity of life. And we'll start to really cool the planet. These trees will be respiring and cooling the air. They'll be creating humidity. They'll be seeding rainfall. And they can really re-trigger this biotic pump. We can rebuild that small water cycle. Every time we take water from the ocean and put it into the ground, we're adding it to our small water cycle. And the more that that goes, it's this positive feedback loop. And so eventually we get the springs returning. We get the rivers running clear and cool. We get fish and life and we get a balanced climate. We get a stable climate. We get a productive climate for life. So this is really important. This is our future we're talking about. And this is our choice. Do we want to be part of the regeneration of the earth or do we want to let human beings move on and for the earth to regenerate herself after us. It's really up to us. So what can you do? There's so many things we can do and I wanna leave you just, just a handful of really actionable things we each can do. First thing is have boots on the ground. And I would say even better have bare feet on the ground get connected to the earth, spend time outside wherever you are. Even if it's on a city street, there's still life happening there and you can learn from it and you can be connected to it. And even if it's just one tree, one tree can have a tremendous impact. If every human being on the planet planted and stewarded one tree, we'd be in a whole different scenario. It's a thing that even a child can do. And when you plant that tree, you can start to develop a relationship with it start to understand how it plays its role within the web of life, how it provides so much to so many different things. We can build gardens that serve as this hub of biodiversity, that give pollinators habitat, that give bees habitat. Nature works in complexity and in diversity. These monocultures are just insane. Everything needs the same nutrient at the same time. And it's just not there. The way that nature works is this diverse interconnection where each plant uses a nutrient and fixes a different nutrient and together those plants work to create a really vibrant ecosystem it can be things like leaky weirs beaver dams vernal pools areas that don't hold water year round but hold water seasonally when it comes and help return that water into the earth even if you're just creating a small rain garden that comes off of the roof of your house, you know, we really need to start looking at our impacts. If you live in a home or you drive a vehicle, you're creating or participating in the creation of a lot of hard landscape on the earth. So how do we offset that with soft landscapes that are even more infiltrative than, than previous? And so whether that's, you know, a nice little swimming feature that takes the water off of the roof of your home and creates a habitat that you can enjoy as a recreation as well, or maybe it's creating these beautiful productive habitats. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's a fruit tree toppling over with the weight of its own natural productivity. No fertilizers, no chemicals, no nothing, just the rain from the sky and the vibrancy of the earth. And there's actually grapes growing up in this tree and the tree is just flopped over with all of its fruit loaded with grapes and it's all just working with the processes of nature whether you're tapping a spring or working with a spring i think one of the biggest things we can do for ourselves is really understand where our drinking water is coming from and fill ourselves with good healthy water it's the biggest thing i notice traveling around is there's a lot of places with really poor quality of water Spring water is drinking water, distilled by the sun, mineralized and energized and filtered by the earth and presented to us. 
well water is fossilized water and doesn't have the same information and it oftentimes has too many of certain minerals rainwater is too distilled it doesn't yet have those minerals and nutrients and it really is spring water that's the vibrant fourth phase charged structured water that will give you the most health and vitality in your life or maybe it's developing a whole ecosystem farm like this worm farmer in australia where we're holding that water in the landscape we're creating terraces on a very steep landscape he's growing worms and composting and growing tree systems and it's all helping the hydrology of his patch of the earth while also producing a livelihood for his farm and family or maybe it's something as elaborate as the Kramaterhof, where it's this education center and it's teaching others how to do these things. It's showing the examples of what's possible. You can take it as little or as far as you want to. I think it's just important that we each start taking some progress in this direction. And maybe you even become the person who leads a movement that revives rivers. Maybe you become a spokesperson for the rivers or a voice for the voiceless. These are all really important roles for us to play. So whichever of these calls to you, that's the one to pursue. So I want you to really remember that water is the earth's blood. It's and any of these things, just think about your own body and how your own body circulates water. And think about the earth and if it's happy, if it's healthy, and if its circulation is intact or not. One of the biggest things you can do is just spend time to connect with water. You know, give gratitude for the water that's giving you all the energy of life. Spend time and connect and put yourself in the shoes of that water. What's it experiencing? Is it healthy or not? Is it happy or sad? These are all different things that when you sit still and you allow yourself to connect with the earth, with nature, with water, you can really start to receive that information from the water. And so one of the best practices I would implore you all to do is to develop a sit spot, a place where you go and just sit and you sit there till your mind goes quiet and then you really start to learn from the landscape. Visiting the same spot each day, you'll notice slight differences in the landscape. And this is the best way to start learning from the book of nature. So really, what I would love to see as far as the future of humanity is for us to decolonize our mind. The landscape has been colonized, but our minds have been colonized too for the constant exploitation. Can you imagine being the subject of that exploitation? If you're always just trying to suck out the maximum value of it, the natural response is to reject that exploitation and the same things are happening with our landscape. So the best way to decolonize your mind is to always have in your heart a little bit more love and respect for both water and nature. Developing your mind is a huge part of this. I see so many people get so into theory. Theory can cripple. You can be a, a theory cripple where you actually don't do anything because you're so tied up in the theories. The best people who do actions, they appreciate the unknown. They know how to work within the unknown and they use that space to learn and understand and evolve. We really want to forethink and be dynamic and adaptive with our thinking, not get pigeonholed into one thing and allow ourselves to evolve as we learn more and more about this beautiful planet. And then it's really important to become literate about your landscape, to not just see it as it is today, but to understand how it was in the past, what processes have changed it, how has it changed recently, and how has it changed in antiquity. And to really, with each landscape you see, start to try and envision it as it once was. You know, what was that landscape as its climax ecosystem? What was it as its most complex before humans started chopping it down to simplify it? And to manifest your world, I think these pieces are really important. Civil courage to stand up for what you know is right. If the laws are, if the laws of man are going against the laws of nature, we need to break those laws of man and we need to follow the laws of nature. And we need to all have civil courage to stand up for all our co-living beings that don't have a voice. They can't go to the town hall and stand up against the project that's going to dump a bunch of toxicity into the lake. We have to do that for them. And so that's having civil courage and taking responsibility within ourselves to be good stewards. 
freedom from attachment. It's really easy to get pigeonholed into one thing. You know, long ago, I was all focused on ecosystem greenhouses. And if I had stayed too attached to that, I would have missed the actual manifestation I was creating in all of this water work. And so we need to remain flexible and not become too attached or entrenched with any of our systems and thinking. It also requires a real relentlessness. You know, it, nature is relentless and we need to be relentless for nature within our man-made environments. And so we need to not let these people push us around. We need to not let these rules that go against nature get in our way. We need to be relentless and persevere, not just for us, but to be good future ancestors. And so it's up to us. Do we want to continue down the watershed death spiral to world wars being fought over water? Or do we want to move into the new water paradigm and start to hold water everywhere we can and repair our landscape and our relationship with water? You know, we've created this huge negative impact on the earth, but we can undo all of it as soon as we decide to and start moving in that direction. We can turn every place in the world into this lush green habit habitat full of life as soon as we start repriming that biotic system. And so it's really about community driven decentralized water retention. And this is what we really are hoping to create at Water Stories. We want to create a platform where you guys can all access this information. You can practice at home. You can develop and build your skills. But you also have a community of peers to help support one another and learn from one another with the idea that hopefully in the future, we're actually coming together as a community and saying, these are our values. These are how we want to change the laws. These are how we want to change our management systems so that future generations don't inherit all of our old same problems. So awesome. that's, Thank you, Zach. yeah, that's the presentation part. Uh, I think we'll do, I'll kind of pass it off to Raleigh and we'll do a couple of live questions, but we really want to get you guys engaging in that online forum. I'm going to be really present on there answering people's questions. We'll answer some of those questions live right within this webinar. But you know, this is really the space that we're creating. So we want to hear from you. What do you need? What are the barriers you need to break down to start doing this work within your own community? Because that's what this is really all about. And Zach, we all appreciate that presentation. You, you flew through so many beautiful examples of guiding us through your journey and SEP's journey, the importance of decentralized water restoration, you know, the fight to preserve water rights against privatization, and most importantly, what we can do in our own community, because I think that's such an important part of all of this, where, you know, we feel oftentimes like we don't, we don't have power, but this is a huge thing that we can empower ourselves to restore water where we are, whether it's a farm, whether it's an urban landscape, whether it's just a community coming together and deciding we want water now. So we're gonna show you guys uh, how to take part in this community. And we're gonna spend some time, the rest of this, we're gonna be around till all, everyone's questions answered, but we want everybody to answer their questions on the community that we're creating. And it only, it only takes a second to sign up. Uh, so we can paste the link here. It's basically, you go to waterstories.app. Uh, you go to waterstories.app. Can everybody see my screen here? Yep. Okay, so you click on community. You click on join, and then you have access to waterstories.circle.so. We'll post the links to everything here. But it's pretty easy. You just, um, you can sign up here. You know, you click this link to sign up. It probably takes a minute or so to, to register and get your link in your email. But once you're here, you can, you can ask Zach any question and the whole community. And so this is gonna grow into this big community here very quickly. And we're gonna provide training, resources, inspiration, and, and examples that everyone can, can take from for how to enact water restoration in your community. And more, most importantly, there's gonna be resources here and help. So you're not going to be alone doing this work. You're going to have people to back you up and to help you and support you. And that's what we're trying to create here. So I encourage you, you know, take a few minutes here, you know, take a look at it and go to waterstories.app, waterstories.circle.so. We'll repost the link. And Cassie, if you can do that in the chat box, that'd be helpful. But 
um, what we're going to do here is we're going to spend some time on the, the Q&A. And once we have some questions posted here, looks like awesome. Looks like a lot of people just joined and registered. And we're going to go answer some questions. We're going to give everybody a few minutes. And in the meantime, we're going to answer, we're going to do some call-in questions while people are joining this community. So if you want to do a call-in question, if you want to, you know, you, want, you kind of want to keep it brief because, you know, we're not doing a live consult here. We just, we just want basic questions and raise your hand, like Zoom function as a function where you raise your hand. So raise your hand and uh, type in a question if, if you want to do a live call-in. Now we can only do like two or three of these, but I guarantee when you're on the community, you're going to have all the time, we're going to have all the time to answer these questions that you all have. And the good thing about it here, it's going to live here. You know, you're, you're going to get a lot of feedback on your questions. So if you miss it, like what Zach says, no worries. Like you'll be able to post on the community and get your questions answered here. So again, the link to that is the main community page is uh, waterstories.app. It's kind of for the, the community the kind of the training we're creating and then the water stories that circle that SO is this online community that we're creating. And let me check if the link is posted here. So I'll give it back. Yeah, really awesome to see all your guys questions already. I'm seeing so many good ones. I'm thinking Raleigh, unless if someone's got their hand raised right now, let's just dive into the questions on the Q and a sure. Um, I'm seeing a couple I'd love to answer. Okay. Well, I'm seeing, I am seeing some hand raises here. Let's, let's go ahead and give two or three of those then. And then, okay. We'll yeah, we'll, those. we'll keep it brief. All right. So where are the hand raises? So this is, it's great. It's great to see too. Okay. So we basically have four people. The first one we're going to, since Jared's the first person to post in there, let's let Jared speak. So if you raise your hand, you got to be prepared to speak. So Jared, you asked your questions first. It's on here. We can go over it and Oh, sorry, that was Jason first posted here. But regardless, we'll allow Jared to speak real quick. So here we go, Jared, what is what is your question? Hey, y'all, thanks for the presentation. It's amazing. Um, my question is about an ecological knowledge commons. And um, I was super inspired by the kind of landscape scale projects that you were showing. And at least where I live, um, a lot of watersheds, you know, are held by who knows, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of small landholders. And I'm wondering about how we coordinate those efforts. Um, Cause you know, you could imagine somebody upstream doing work and then having no idea what's going on, you know, even a couple hundred meters downstream. So I'm wondering if you know of uh, work being done kind of on that scale. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there's some systems in place, um, like for example, in Europe, there's this project Drinkable Rivers, uh, where they're kind of keeping a, an accounting of what's happening in the different waterways. Um, there's also the River Keepers, uh, which is an organization that's really done a good job of basically policing pollution on different waterways. Um, but I think you're talking about taking it the next level, even where you start to understand what kind of positive impacts are on the landscape. This is one of the things we're very much hoping to build within the platform, where basically you could log on and say, I'm in this watershed, and you could actually see examples, both good and bad, of issues of concern or points of restoration within this platform. Uh, because it really is about getting us all on the sh same table and around the same table and finding common ground. Uh, and that's the other piece we really hope this community will become a platform for. We have to all have start with the same understanding to find that common ground. And so one of the first steps is actually creating this knowledge hub, like you mentioned, this resource where everyone can go to and, and learn these big picture things so that they can then start to see how it applies on their landscape and where it applies. Um, so, you know, we're hoping eventually there's 
kind of a citizen accountability initiative as part of it, where we're both providing really good examples and areas of concern within different watersheds. Cool. Thank you, Jared. Thanks, Zach. All right. So Thanks. Here. Thank you, Jared. So Brian is the next person that's got his hand up. All right, Brian. Here we go. Fire away. Unmute. Here we go. Hi, thanks so much for um, pulling this all together. It's super awesome. Um, I've been, I'm up in Pacific Northwest um, and have been doing uh, design consultations and stuff for clients for a number of years. And I have four projects moving forward this coming summer, hopefully. And I'm just curious if you have any insight on ways to um, show clients and to move past the whole permitting issue and encourage them to move forward with projects, even though um, leg or legally it's, it's pretty cumbersome. I've even had uh, Army Corps of Engineers lawyer try to go through the whole permitting process and not be able to do it and get frustrated um, with the whole system. Yeah, a great question and a big challenge, particularly in the United States and in Europe. I don't see it anywhere in the world as bad as the United States and Europe in terms of litigation around your own landscape and what you're able to do. Um, so it's a big issue. And, you know, the thing is, no one ever sat down and I was actually talking to a fisheries biologist yesterday about this. No one ever sat down and figured out the whole regulatory body and made it made sense or be a navigable system. It's all this patchwork of one thing at a time and band-aids. And so it is very complex and convoluted. Um, some of it depends on the scale of the project. There is in many cases, like for example, in Oregon, I know there is laws that Basically, if your project is primarily to reduce soil erosion and improve water quality, you can circumnavigate the permitting and you can do things to a certain scale without any permitting. Um, but also, I think a lot of times the, the permitting process, it's obnoxious, it's a pain in the butt, it takes time, but it is pretty navigable as well. So the alternate reservoir process, it takes some time, it takes some forethought. Um, the one thing that it really doesn't navigate at all is improvement of habitat, because basically in that process, if there's habitat at all, they enter this hands-off approach where you're not able to do anything. Um, whereas if it's not habitat, then you can generate habitat. So it works unless if you get into in-channel work and that's where we really just need to come up with some new laws and some new ways to open up pathways uh, that allow for this restoration to happen because there, there are legal and permitting challenges along the way. Yeah, I've heard from Mark Shepard kind of says, you know, you got to frame some of this stuff in terms of how, um, you know, conservation districts frame it and not in terms of how, say, permaculturists frame it. Yeah, absolutely. And the really important words there are erosion control and water quality improvement. Um, and so, you know, if you submit a permit and it's not in channel and it has those words on it, you're probably going to get through um, without too much issue. It's the, the in channel work where you really start to run into trouble then what you can do is use permeable structures. So whether they're beaver dam analogs, fascines, things that aren't an impermeable impoundment of water, don't trigger those regulations. So you can't achieve the same thing, which is unfortunate, but enables you to do something that achieves a result um, while still fitting within the bounds of the law. Uh -huh. All right, thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. So we're gonna we're gonna move to uh, answering some questions on the Water Stories platform. So Zach, do you want to do it on your screen, or I could just share my screen? Share um, my yeah, I can. Sh let me share my screen because okay, I kind of cool. got a few that I already really like. Um, nice. That I'd like to answer here. 
So let's see here. Um, restoration is cooler, literally. Michael <laughs> Chang, awesome. Yeah, it absolutely is cooler. At the Kramatorov, they haven't taken these kind of measurements, but in Rajasthan, these projects in India, they've measured a two degree Celsius reduction in the temperature through this work. So they have actually already offset all of the you know, climate attributed warming that they've experienced by doing this retention work. And that's at a huge scale. They've gone from 2% greenery in this district to 48% greenery. And that's what enabled the reduction in temperature two degrees Celsius. Um, so that's the, the best project that I know in terms of those metrics. Although I imagine there are some more metrics out of Willie Smith's project and other ones. Um, but you know, really incredible that on that huge of a scale, we can cause that huge of a reduction in temperature in pretty short order. You know, it really was 35 years ago was Rajendra working alone on that one water body. And it wasn't till 20 years ago that it really started gaining steam. So it really happens quick once people start moving in the right direction. Um, let's see here. So I guess I should just start at, at the bottom here. Yeah, Jason. Jason's the first person to post yeah. here. Uh, so I'm finishing my last semester. I'm gonna sure. So really good question about tribal communities. Um, it brings up that tribal communities actually have their own sovereignty of water and land. And so a lot of these projects that are stopping some of the worst environmental degradation, it's actually on tribal sovereignty rights. Uh, so that's something that we can all participate in, whether we're tribal or not, by helping support these treaties and trying to hold our government accountable to uphold these treaties. Um, so, you know, I see tremendous opportunities. Uh, you know, it would depend on which tribal community you're working within and, and what App, what techniques might apply best there. But for example, one of my friends and colleagues, um, he's done a lot of work with the Hopi and the Navajo and he talks about their traditional agricultural lands could be totally restored pretty easily, but they've just been left in fallow for tribal conflict and how they were kind of smushed together. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities there. I think there's already a cultural affinity towards this kind of work. It's really returning to previous forms of land management. So it offers a really good opportunity for healing of that relationship, um, but also really providing examples because as soon as you get into tribal communities, even the Army Corps technically doesn't have authority. So they really have authority to do these projects. So the issues that Brian was bringing up with all these permitted and legal issues, none of those apply on a reservation. So they actually provide a great point to show examples within the US and within these regions that are more litigious uh, because they have their own sovereignty. And basically if the tribal council approves it, it's good and you can go forward with it. Um, so, you know, I think there's huge potential there to show all sorts of things from improvement of quality of life to improvement of ecosystem function and habitat uh, to improvement of community relations, depending on, you know, what, what your exact focus is there, Jason. Great question. Sandy landscapes, sandy landscapes with little clay. So, so much of the water retention work functions around clay, but there's also water retention work that's holding water within the living soil sponge. So, if you're in a soil that's really nothing but sand, a lot of times I hear this question and there is still clay. You know, so many times I'll do a test slice and just a hundred feet different, one pit will be nothing but silt or sand and then the other will have the clay layers we're looking for. Um, so I would employ you to really search through your landscape. Sometimes those layers are two, three meters deep um, to really understand if you do have clay or whether you just don't have clay in the surface. But assuming you really have no clay and let's say your beach sand all the way down, building that biology is the best way to hold on to the water. And what happens is in that soil biology creates all these hydrophilic surfaces 
And with the structuring of water, with fourth phase water, it actually holds that water much more than you'd imagine from just the organic matter. So as you build up that biology within the soil, you're also building up the water holding capacity of the soil just in the surface area around those microbes, let alone any organic matter benefits that you start to get. So if I'm really in a sandy location and there's no way to create water bodies, you probably don't even want to create earthworks at all. And you probably want to focus on building that vegetation system. So really focusing on the treatment of the catchment area. And that can really deliver a lot of watershed benefits. Next question here, guidance on terraforming and how to deal with traditional experts that glaze over when you challenge their norms. Uh, good questions. Uh, the hydrologist wants to only drain water into lakes. That sounds about right. Um, how can we address these issues personally? So I find in dealing with anybody, you have to meet them where they are. And so it's actually best to start by listening. Start by listening and understanding where they're coming from and what might resonate with them. I'll explain what I do very differently depending on who I'm actually talking to. Um, so, you know, if you're speaking to a hydrologist, you might speak to the total amount of water that's infiltrating into the aquifer. So you have this surface flow that's moving, you know, draining water into the lakes, but then you have the subsurface flow in these aquifers that more and more every year are getting dry at the end of the year at the driest times when we need them most. And so I think for a hydrologist, that's something that they might understand. Um, now, if you're looking at a civil engineer, it might be a different thing. You might really you know, go at it from the flooding angle and how these different impoundment zones actually distribute the flooding water and reduce the amount of pressure uh, and stress on the built environment. So there's different ways that you could navigate this with different experts, but it really has to start with understanding where they're coming from, hearing them and giving them some acknowledgement that, that you know, find that common ground and then build from that common ground. As soon as you start with confrontation, the whole situation is going to devolve. Uh, so you really have to start by finding some kind of common ground. I'm in South Africa in a water scarce area. The city is drilling boreholes to provide water for people. How do we go about getting local authorities to change their practices? Do we have resources that can show them? Is there anything that you can do? So this is a huge problem. You know, this is the band-aid solution that's going to make it all so much worse in the long run. And it's going to make it worse for a long time. Um, you know, we are seeing California probably be in within 10 years of becoming Syria because they're depleting the aquifer so much and they're just sucking more and more out it's going to take a long time to offset that damage. South Africa, if they employ the same kind of engineering approach, you're just pushing the cliff higher. And eventually you're going to fall off the cliff. The higher you push it, the harder the fall is going to be. Um, so, you know, really looking at how to manage that seasonal water and how to put as much of that seasonal water into the ground. Because if you want to use that aquifer water, you need to be recharging it. And I think in this scenario, I would go to the bank account analogy. If you're just drawing out of that bank account and you're constantly drawing more than you're putting into, everyone can understand that that's gonna go bad. Um, so even if you're gonna put in the boreholes to provide emergency water, you also need to make sure you're infiltrating even more than that for the boreholes to actually provide a long-term resource. Um, so there's a lot of information out there on the subsidence in California all of the issues that's happening from that water table. So that's one of the things I point out. Here's an area that did this and their problems are only getting worse. Uh, and then I look at the situation in India as a counterpoint, as a counterexample, where here's a situation where they did decentralized water retention and the wells that they had in the past that are dry have water again. And so there's two different ways you could go. You can go deeper into the earth and draw more out or you can put more in from the top and that actually reinvigorates your existing systems. C 
sealing ponds. I'm building over a dozen ponds interconnected by swales and spillway in our food forest garden. We have heavy clay, but loads of shale and rock. How can I seal these features without very expensive EPDM liners? Great question. I try and avoid liners at all costs. You're really not returning the water to the earth. You really just have an, an above ground tank at that point. Um, and in the best case, those liners are very expensive and they're gonna last 20, 25, maybe 30 years. And then you gotta redo the whole thing. So it's a very temporary solution. It's very expensive. It doesn't have the ecosystem benefits and it's harder to maintain because the way that it isolates the water from the earth, you oftentimes get stagnant water, algae blooms. It's really hard to maintain the quality of that water that way. So what we're doing instead, it sounds like you have clay to work with. Um, sounds like you have loads of shale and rock. So I would really be exploring the different places within the landscape. Where has water over time accumulated that clay? And where is there clay in an area that you could use it? I would use the shale and the rock to build up either side of the dam, the embankments of it, and then use the clay that I have to build up that core, that center of the dam, making sure that you're tying it all into some watertight layer. So it might be that you have clay, then you have shale and rock, and then you have bedrock or hard rock or something that's watertight. And you can use the clay to make your key, use the rock to build the two embankments, and then you're happy. Or it may be that you know you have shale and rock and then you have clay and you're tying into that layer. Or it may be that you have no layer below that shale and rock that's watertight. That gets into a really tricky scenario where I'd start to question if uh, a water body is actually suitable in that location. So that's another important thing. We're talking a lot about water bodies and building water bodies, but not every landscape is suitable for a water body. There's a lot of landscapes where other techniques are best and better to implement. Uh, and so you want to really do a careful analysis of the ground, the landscape itself. I really, it's a big pet peeve of mine, landscape designers that design on the maps because it's so much less information in the map than on the landscape. So really experience that landscape, put your feet on the ground, get the smells of the landscape, see the plants of the landscape, see the aspects. All of those things should be informing your judgment as far as location of water bodies. Cool, thanks for answering that. Um, as a quick, quick note here, we're probably gonna go live for another 30 minutes or so, but then we're gonna keep answering these questions like off the webinar. So this, this Q&A will keep going, but just after the webinar. So if for some reason we run out of time here, we will, well, your questions will continue to get answered. So don't worry if that webinar ends a bit early, your questions are gonna get answered. We really appreciate this. Just in the last 30 minutes, we had, we had almost a hundred people join water stories. How cool is that? Like, so this is, this is growing. It's going to continue to grow. This, it's amazing. It's really beautiful to see because I know like we all want to support each other. We all want to have a place where we can talk about water restoration. That's off of Facebook. <laughs> and um, who is that? What do you think about this? Our, our good friend, OG Seth Peterson. Once he's got his hand raised, do you think we could devote five minutes and Hear a question from Seth. Yeah, I think we can do a question. Okay. Seth. No swearing, Seth. <laughs> All right, Seth, Seth, we unmuted you. Welcome on. Uh, hey, y'all. Am I coming through? Oh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, okay, thank you so much, Raleigh. Thank you so much, Cassie. Thank you so much, Zach, for doing this. Um, I know you guys are busy, and I know Zach travels a bunch, so find the time to put this information out there. At this level is fabulous. Congratulations. Um, my questions, I got two questions about last year when Zach, he did, a, um, he did, you know, a meetup in training with, but like to try and get a crew going and, um, teach them and train them in these techniques and take them on site and start working with a crew. And so I'm curious how that went and how that's going now. Um, and a second question is at that event, you showed a video on the water cycle that you were developing that was by far the best I've ever seen to describe it and understand it. And so I'm curious um, where that video is and if you, if you guys got any further on completing that one. Um, so there you go. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I'll actually answer the second one first, just because that's a little bit easier. Um, so I think the video you're referencing is actually one of the ones we showed during the course of the presentation. Hopefully there wasn't too much lag and people could see that pretty well. Um, we're just now, I'm making some tweaks to the narration and that's something that will be on the Water Stories platform soon for people to share with one another. Um, so the, the animation piece is done and we're now just changing around some narration bits. We've been doing a lot of focus groups with it to make it really understandable with the idea that this is something anyone could share with other people to learn about the water cycle. Maybe it's even a teacher's aid. Um, so those animations you guys saw in the presentation, those will have a narration and live on this Water Stories platform sometime soon. Um, as far as the tryouts, the event itself went really well. Um, you know, we got 10 just amazing people that then we brought five of those onto a project uh, this past year. Really worked our butts off, put them through the ringer, um, <laughs> worked my butt off training five new people all at once. Um, in the end, you know, we all really still love and, and like each other and hang out, but two were not a great fit long term for the crew. Three were really solid and really good fit. Um, so we've expanded the crew permanently with those three people. They've actually even started each taking on their own micro responsibilities. So that's been really awesome. Um, you know, it's something that we'll keep doing in the future bit by bit. And we'll probably, we'll, we will start doing in-person workshops as well as training. Uh, but for this coming year, you know, we had such a good thing with the tryouts this year. Now that we're launching Water Stories, I'm trying to really just tend the crew size for a year and not add a bunch of new people so that instead of training new people, I'm really working on training people through this online platform. Um, so it went well, you know, I had this whole vision of franchising and uh, I've come to around that that was a little bit unrealistic timeline wise, um, just in terms of how much people know, need to know and gain to be able to do that. And so that's where I really shifted gears to this Water Stories platform so that instead of it all running through my business, it like water can be more decentralized and have many different businesses around this and start to train up people in different areas of the world so that it doesn't all bottleneck in the flow of my business, so to speak. Awesome, Seth. Thanks for hopping on. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That exactly was my question about the bottleneck and where you're going. So I look forward and you know you got our support. So plant some water. Oh, yeah. See you in Berkeley soon. Peace, Seth. Oh, and Zach, you might want to refresh it. There's like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's just yeah. dozens of more. I see some, so I see some more I, I want to do here. So uh, I might ruffle some feathers with this one, but I'm going for it. Um, water restoration and native flora. So this is um, a, a bigger issue. So to give some framing, I think there was an incredible coup that happened. And the coup was done by the chemical industries and some that somehow they got the environmentalists to be pro biocide through this narrative of native species. Now, nature doesn't work like that. This whole concept of native species is that, you know, there's a slice in time and that's what's natural and everything outside of that is unnatural. But nature is constantly evolving and constantly moving and plants are constantly moving around the world. Animals are moving them. People are moving them. And every plant, if it's showing up in an environment, it's serving a function. It's serving a role. So, so many times these native invasive species are actually solving the very problems we're creating. So in the Great Lakes, you know, I could go forever with this, but in the Great Lakes, you have these zebra mussels. You have these Great Lakes that are very toxic all this nutrient going into the water, causing all these algae blooms and death in the lakes. Then you have these zebra mussels that are this willing organism. And they're saying, hey, you guys have too many nutrients in here. We're going to come in and we're going to filter feed this. We're going to clean it all up. 
Yet, because we have this concept that because the zebra mussels weren't there before, they shouldn't be there now, we're trying to eradicate the organism that's trying to fix our destruction. And so I really think that this whole concept of nativism, it's actually a weird manifestation of our white guilt for what we did to the indigenous peoples around the world. And I heard an Aboriginal guy say it best. He said, you know, if all of us black folk can tolerate it, all you white folk on our landscape, you think all you white folk could tolerate a few white plants on the landscape. And they have this situation in Australia with the willow where the Aboriginal people say, you know, ask the fish, ask the platypus whether it likes the willow. And what you see is that they do. It actually creates habitat. It creates cool shaded water. And so the fish and habitat are more in the area where the willows are. Yet there's this campaign funded by the government, not founded on science, where they go through and systematically ring bark the willow and poison them, destroying the plant that again is trying to repair the destruction we've caused. Um, and so it's just really being so out of tune with our landscape that we don't understand that everything has a role, everything has a purpose. And if it's showing up there, there's a reason for it. Um, and so, you know, while I love native species, I'm not going to go around spraying biocide on invasive species because they have a role too. They have a purpose. They are part of nature. Um, and, you know, a lot of these invasives are actually coming in to repair our damage. So they're showing up because of us, but then we try and destroy them and get them out of the way. And to give you an idea on how far this goes, you know, the one of the first ways they found these hygroscopic microorganisms that cause rain is in tomato cultivation. These same microorganisms cause discoloration in the tomatoes. So there's actually a campaign to try and eradicate this organism because it causes discoloration in the tomatoes, yet it causes rain. So we're actually trying to destroy our own rain causing organisms because we're just so disconnected from our surroundings. Hopefully I didn't piss off too many people with that. Well, I think universally we are all against glyphosate and pesticides and anything that's really destroying our soil life and our precious insect life that, you know, it's plummeting and crashing. So if, if... yeah, one more piece on that, just a, a great little tidbit. So I, I got to hang out in Australia with one of the scientists that was one of the leading people behind the eradication of the willows. And he kind of had a, a coming to terms moment where he realized this isn't actually backed by any science that shows anything. And he calls it a biodiversity bonfire because what's happened is they have these eroded creek beds all with the willow. They ring bark the willow, cut it, pile it up. Then because they've destroyed all the habitat, all of the biodiversity moves into those willow piles and then they light them on fire and a big biodiversity bonfire. And so it's, it's well-intentioned, but it's actually still causing damage. Messed up. Uh, so someone asked about natural bubblers. Um, I'm not exactly clear what kind of bubbler you mean aeration or some people call the spring boxes bubblers um but i'm just going to go with aeration there's some really nice set uh, the best way is to just circulate the water circulate the water through a little creek system something with rocks and in the area where that water is bouncing all along the rocks in and around those rocks live the bacteria that filter and clean the water and so you're creating a mini stream system and so if you have a water body that has no flow through you might consider something like a little solar pump with a dc water pump uh, so that it doesn't need any battery doesn't need any inverter when the sun's out the water's circulating and that is helping oxygenate and enrich the water um, there's lots of different types with that fountains bubble aerators Adding air to the water is great. Adding movement to the water is even better. Um, so I'd, I'd look at exploring some kind of circulation system. Yeah, and Natasha, I will uh, I'll attach a video to that thread about one of the projects where Zach used that system. And 
and one of the natural swimming ponds he created. Oh man, we've got so many questions coming in. This is awesome. Heaps. Um, I'm trying to find where I was here. Okay, so water is a commodity. Yeah, water has just started getting traded in the U.S. I think this is, you know, now's our point of inflection. Now's our time to make a big noise about it and try and prevent it because the further it goes down that road, the harder it is to reverse. Um, some other places where they've made some some good grounds, Bolivia actually gave rights to nature within their constitution. So that's some legislature to maybe be modeled. Um, the Maori people in New Zealand have given personhood status to a river or maybe several rivers. And that's a movement that's gaining steam around the world because we don't protect natural resources, but we protect property. Uh, and so giving these environmental features, personhood status gives them a little bit more defense in the eyes of the law. Um, and I think we need some kind of sweeping legislation. Now there is this codes for earth and codes for water that outlines a little bit of this. Um, but you know, we need some legislation that says water is a common good and it's the right of people and of living beings and of earth and it should be managed for the greater common good. And anywhere where people are managing water for the better common good, they can circumvent the water rights systems and the different systems that are causing all of these issues. There's a great document on water privatization called Lords of Water that shows when water privatization happened in the UK and Australia, it just became a disaster because it was managed for financial profit. These companies declared bankruptcy when things became unprofitable and it just created water scarcity. And the two countries that and have been able to resist it so far is France nationalized their water commodities, like it's not privately trading. And it's not currently like commodity trade across the US, but you can see that it's, it's they're testing it out. Wall Street seeing how much they can privatize because they see that, oh, water is gonna be scarce, let's, Let's control this asset and try to privatize it and profit from water scarcity. And we got to stop that. Yeah, that's a great film for people to watch to, to become a little bit more aware of those issues. Um, working with codes. Uh, you know, I think these movements that you're mentioning within different municipalities are critical. Um, I don't know of a, an international group working to make codes greener. Uh, I, I mentioned that um, that codes for water and codes for earth, but that's more a charter, I think a charter for water. Um, that would be one thing I would look at. Some communities like Tamara are trying to pilot this, but I don't know any, any good groups to really send you to. Um, maybe other people have ideas and maybe they can answer or follow up with that question because that would be a, a wonderful resource to be within Water Stories if anyone knows about that. Um, Jenna has a great question here. Ever thought about the greatest importance on the change of the weather pattern? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, ideally, we would actually work from the coasts inland. Uh, and I know some people that study these bacteria that say, you know, the U.S. just has one little problem, the state of California. And if we could actually, California is a great place and all along the West Coast and around the world, anywhere where those maritime currents are entering, because the more we trigger that biotic pump there, the more it feeds through the whole system. So if we were to re-green the whole Western coast, we would get more precipitation throughout the mountain West because we're restarting that pump. Same thing around all, you know, the more work we do in the Amazon, the more work will continue to feed through the South American continent. You look at a place like Cyprus and it's actually, it's heat dome is holding any moisture from entering. So as soon as they break that force, they will start to have a conveyor belt again. Um, so you do want to factor in, you know, the big water cycle. Ideally, you're factoring that within your work if you're really trying to have this huge scale change. Uh, the best way to influence clients to move forward with a water retention project, even though there is no permit path. Um, you know, everything ultimately is complaint driven. Um, and so it depends on your relationships with your neighbors. You can do 
a lot of work within the ask for forgiveness instead of permission domain. Um, you know, there are some thresholds that you really want to avoid, like tampering with fish habitat and things like that. Um, but, you know, most projects, good, bad, or indifferent that happen just happen from people doing it. Um, and so it, it really comes down to each landowner to have that civil courage to say, I'm going to do what's right for my landscape and I'm going to deal with the consequences uh, if they come up. And so that's obviously that's a call that each client needs to make. And some people have more civil courage than others. And so I find myself continuing to work for the clients that have more civil courage and the clients that don't, there's not much you can do to help them. Uh, Jane had a good question. So uh, in North America, we had beavers managing the watersheds, which were doing this incredible amount of work. And in other continents as well, there were beavers um, doing an incredible amount of work. But then there are also all of these participants that are all playing their own role and they're all optimizing some life process. Um, so, you know, whether it's the wolves, they have an impact on the watershed too. And the ungulates and the mammals, they have an impact. The birds have an impact. So the beaver is this really sentinel animal and really easy to understand, but they all play a role and they're all landscape engineers. So even if it's just the bird eating the blackberries and spreading those seeds around, it's a landscape engineer as well. Um, the impacts just are more modest without uh, and with animals that aren't as uh, industrious as the beaver. Uh, South Africa um, contacts to work with. I don't have any direct contact. We have some contacts of people who've contacted us in the past wanting to do a project and um, we'll probably go there for a series of projects sometime in the near future. Um, but I don't know any people personally in South Africa that I could really refer you to. Um, it's something where I hope to train up a whole bunch of people in South Africa because that's a place that really needs it. Um, and if anyone else has any ideas, I'd love you to, to follow up with that question as well, because part of what we want to do with Water Stories is really build these connections between people and places and points of knowledge uh, so that we can all work together in this. So separating materials as you dig. Um, I like to know the actual technique to separate materials while digging and identify them. Uh, the soil is pretty hard to recognize the difference. Uh, how deep should you dig? Is it until you find the hard clay layer and you can dig until you think it's suitable for your project? Yeah, it is so much project dependent. I, I can't give you any depth because some projects it's one meter, some projects is three, some projects it's 20 centimeters. Um, there's a couple of different factors. So when you're digging with the excavator, you can usually actually feel some differences. Um, you can see some differences. You can see some differences in how the material crumbles or doesn't. But if in doubt, get out and put your hands in the soil and do a texturing. And so you can do either a rolled out worm or press a ribbon, get that material to the right moisture content, and then you can roughly determine its percentage sand, silt, and clay. Um, so if I'm digging through a layer and I'm like, I can't tell if this should be in my topsoil layer or my clay layer, or my structural layer, I'll actually get out and feel it with my hand and then say, okay, well, that's this for roughly this deep. Um, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you need someone outside of the machine like telling you, okay, at this depth, that changes. So you should really just take that. The big things to keep in mind there, topsoil is this hugely important resource. We really want to safeguard that as much as we can and conserve it throughout the project and keep it at the surface not bury it with subsoil um, and then we really want to keep our nice clay soil which you can usually see in the way it crumbles as you're digging through it separate from our more permeable material um, and you know those 
variables are all going to change so much site to site, but hopefully that gives you a little bit better understanding. Oh, Zach, I wanted to point out a function right here. Why don't you click on comment real quick? Mm -hmm. Just click on any, any of these things, just click on the comment section. So folks, if you, if you want to keep interacting with this community, you can post a video, like you can record a quick, like uh, video on your screen as a question, and then we can get back to the question that way. So if you, if you'd rather just like ask a question live via a video, like you could do that. And so that, that's one thing, like I'll chop up this video and post the responses as answers there, but it's just another, another level of interactivity that we can have on this forum. Should be fun. Plus we get to meet each other face to face with videos. Should be nice. And Raleigh, do we want to, we want to keep this to two hours still? What are you thinking? I mean, I'm, I'm cool going a bit longer. You know, we could, we could yeah. stretch it. We probably don't want it, you know, like two and a half hours. That's kind of yeah. long, but two hours yeah. and five minutes, two hours, and 10 minutes, totally fine. We can go another 10 minutes. I think that's cool. cool. We'll do another another couple of questions here. Really good question about acupuncture points. Uh, can you say more about what you look for in the acupuncture points and how they might define themselves? This is where you really want to be on the landscape and be using all of your senses. Sometimes it's I can smell or feel the humidity difference in the earth. Sometimes the plants tell you what's going on. Um, and you also, you don't need to know each plant to know what it's telling you. So for example, any new environment I land in, I'm constantly scanning and looking for patterns and I'll see which plants like it wet and which plants like it dry. You know, what's growing at the edge of the road that's really dry and what's growing down in the ditch. And based on those patterns, I can then understand better how water is moving through the landscape. So I might see certain plants that indicate there's a spring in the ground there. Um, I might see that certain trees are growing differently. I might even see that certain trees are really struggling and that's a sign that it's really wet there. Um, so, you know, all of those things, the land shape as well will show you the flow of water over time. So a lot of times, even if a spring's not flowing, you can see where it might be by the water having carried away the other material previously. And you get kind of a, a shelf where that water presents itself. Um, but all of those things, you know, the plants, the smell, the shape of the land, the feel of the soil, the feel of the soil underfoot, and there's really an intuitive sense that you begin to develop as well, working in this space where sometimes you'll understand things and not be sure exactly why. And I think that comes with tacit knowledge. Uh, I heard this great story of some trackers in the Arctic and they were tracking the musk oxen. And the musk oxen, when the wolves come, they're in the tundra, so they, they can't run away. What they do is they round up the young and the weak in the middle, and then one of the musk oxen goes and charges the wolves and tries to get them away. And so this traditional tracker, he says, oh, that's the track of the one who will go to meet the wolves. And so this Western person who's learning tracking says, um, you know, how do you know that that's the one that's going to get the wolves? And he just looks at him bewildered and he says, well, because my dad told me that's the one that will go meet the wolves and his dad told him. Um, so there's this tacit intuitive knowledge that comes when we really get in tune with ourselves and the landscape. And that certainly factors into finding these acupuncture points as well. So drainage area ratio to pond water feature volume. Regarding the final one principle, ratio of area feeding draining into a proposed dam or pond and the volume of the dam or pond. What is the ratio derived and how important is it to stick to it? Uh, I suppose this changes depending on the soil type. Yeah. What tools or methods do you propose to measure the first part of the ratio? Um, so this is going to change very much based on context. It's going to base on the runoff proportion of your soil. You know, it's probably somewhere between 35% and 65%, depending on if you're sandier or clayier. Um, how much moisture do you receive in your climate? And then what's the seasonality of that moisture? Is it spread out throughout the season or is it all at once? And so you're going to need to factor in all of those things. Then what I'll do is I'll look at the catchment area 
you know, water is always running at a right angle to contour. So what is the total area that feeds through a given drainage point where I might create a pond? And then based on that soil, if it's really sandy, I might estimate 35% of that total or even less making its way to that water body. If it's really clay, I might estimate 65% or more making its way to that water body. That gives you a total amount of water that you can expect there throughout the year. Then you have to factor in your seasonality for how big that should be, how much of a surge you want to catch, how much you're going to lose through the dry season. Um, and then also very important is to factor in even bigger than the 100 year event. I'll usually do my calculations based off of the 100 year event, but then make sure that I size my spillway so that it can handle an event even greater than that, so that we're really building things that can last a long time and then aren't going to degrade as different flooding events come through the landscape. Uh, that touches a little bit more on the when trying to calculate runoff from landscape maps. Are there topographic apps that can help with these calculations? You know, a lot of times I'll just use Google Earth or some other map, even an on the ground map, something with a scale. And then I, I do all my calculations in metric because it's really easy. Um, and then I'll convert them to Imperial units. And, you know, you're using that land mass times the amount of precipitation over a year times whatever percentage or reduction you're getting in your runoff uh, and that helps you get to that total figure so like i mentioned that percent for runoff it's typically between 35 and 65 percent it's going to be even higher off of a road um, but you're you're generally going to fall somewhere in that ballpark depending on different factors If you include a well-developed educational aspect to your pro design and project, it adds a lot of weight to your proposal. I agree. And we actually, now that we have so many projects and clients, we really actually select for the projects that have a public element where other people will be able to come and experience and learn from this landscape. Because what we really want is model projects all around the world. The reason I feel so hell bent on doing this and confident is because I've seen these model projects. I've seen the results, I've experienced them, I've tasted the food, I've swam in the water. And so we need to have these model projects all around the world so that people in different regions can come experience them and start to understand what they can do. Uh, water is information. I'm interested to understand the language of water as well as that of fire, earth, and air. How do you perceive this, Zach? I understand water like energy is not created or destroyed, only transferred over time. What does water want? Uh, how do we make that happen? You know, I think exploring the Tao will open up a lot of the water world to you. Um, you know, I think it's this force that it, it, it doesn't really have its own manifestation so much, but it is this constantly loving, eternally forgiving, so humble yet so powerful element. Uh, and in its structuring, it actually provides the electrical gradient for life to happen. And so I'd really implore all of you to read the fourth phase of water by Gerald Pollack and start to understand how water is probably the energy currency that life runs on, um, even more so than mitochondria. And it's actually that crystallization of the water structure that happens in contact with hydrophilic surfaces that creates that electrical gradient and the free electrons that then energize and give power to us. Um, so water is information, it's energy, it's currency, uh, and you know, I think accessing that information, you really, it's like a, it's like a pond. When you're looking out at a pond and there's ripples all over the water, you don't see the reflection clearly. The reflection is distorted by all these ripples. And if that pond is your mind, the ripples are thoughts. And so when you have your own thoughts and your monkey brain is active, you're not seeing the water clearly. 
when you get to that state that you let all those thoughts leave and you become clear, then you start to see the reflection clearly. Um, so as far as getting information from water, that's how I really go about connecting with that. Um, um, someone has a question of the land back movement and um, yeah, it would absolutely, the more land that is in tribal governance control, they have their own sovereignty. So now tribal governance has its own issues, just like our own governance does. Um, but they generally, being that they have more control and a little bit less structure to them, it's easier to move through those spaces. Um, so I think absolutely the land back movement could help put more land under tribal sovereignty, which then allows them to do these restoration projects without triggering the Army Corps and all of these different authorities um, that really complicate the process. Raleigh, what do you think? Should we keep going or we're going to have to wrap up, I think, I think that, before we get to all of them? But yeah, well, definitely. Unfortunately, we got to wrap up before we get to everybody. Um, and great questions. I'll be on the yeah. forum today, tomorrow, over the weekend. Um, you know, these questions that I've already answered here, I'll wait for Raleigh to post the videos for. Mm -hmm. But these other questions I'll really be diving into and answering over the next hours and days. So, you know, don't stop with the questions. I love all these questions. And I love that now that we have this platform, I can answer all of these questions once in a public forum where everyone can benefit from because we get so many questions and emails and it's, I just don't have enough time to answer them as these one-off emails, but when we answer them in a way that everyone can benefit from them, it seems like a really valuable use of time. So I really appreciate everyone getting on the forums, everyone asking your questions there. Uh, Cause you know, together we're really trying to build this knowledge base in this community and a tribe of people that are going to come together and act for water. Yeah, that's the goal. All these people are interested in water restoration. We have a community that will back you up when you're ready for your own projects. And so you'll have the knowledge, the professional training, the resources, and the support to do these kind of projects where you are. So keep your eyes tuned. We got some really cool things coming up. Like we're going to work on a documentary about Rajendra Singh, uh, Walter Yena, where we got a piece on Zach coming up. And eventually Sepp Holzer, that's going to be really cool. So a lot of these people doing inspiring work, we're going to have pieces on. And, and eventually we're going to have training courses on water restoration. So that will be pretty incredible. So really like keep your eyes peeled and, and just try to be as active as you can on the community because it's this flame that has been lit. And then we'll be able to all work together to make something really cool happen. So I'm going to stop the recording right now and we're going to end this webinar. I really appreciate everybody's time. Zach, thanks for donating your time to creating this. It's awesome. You went above and beyond, like just putting this all together. So I appreciate it. Thanks folks. Came from Sustainable Design Masterclass, Elemental Ecosystems, Soil Regen Summit, Hermes, uh, Regen Canada, and, and just wherever you came from. Thank you for being a part of water restoration, soil restoration, ecosystem restoration, and the creation of a better earth. So appreciate all your time and you will all get the replay after this. Just check your inbox and we hope to interact with you all soon again. So take care everybody. Have a good day and have a good weekend. Ciao.